morning, ladies and gentlemen, guest speakers. There's a, there's a silence when you need it. I hope you've all had at least one mouthful of coffee or tea to start the morning. Delighted to welcome here to the Kingsley this morning. My name is Gronya Bagnell. I'm a program lead at STEAM Education, a non-for-profit down in UCC. We have a program that excites and inspires young children from national school and the wonders and power of science, technology, engineering, art and maths. And I was in, delighted to be invited to the IT Tech Talk Committee to add all things wonderful, a bit of diversity, a bit of shaking up the, the panel and a bit of excitement in the buzz and the cluster that we have here in Cork and its regions. IT, we all know pretty much about it, but to introduce us this morning to our life science buddies and partners and that we partner up and people are not surprised that we do a lot of business together, but I guess this is the first opportunity at IT at Cork to welcome some of our partners from that area of life science to come and share. Let's call it very high level, I told them to be a bit high level, low level, um, of what they're doing in their industries and we'll be delighted to further that talk. But this morning we're going to kick off, which I'm very passionate about myself, a female CEO, a court native. I did have to get down and, and under the straw to, to find them. Delighted to be um, suggested by one of our board members at ITA Cork, Bill Liao, who unfortunately couldn't be here this morning. Um, part of Rebel Bio, a UCC graduate, a part of Bridges Masses, there was a huge event that was held in City Hall next week. Um, without further ado, I introduce you to our soapbox speaker, Emer Shea. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emer O'Shea. Um, I'm CEO of Conchi Therapeutics, and we are a startup company based here in Cork, developing biologics, which are protein-based drugs, initially for the veterinary industry and later on for the human therapeutic use. So I suppose what relevance do I have to a talk like this today? And this is where I think absolutely everything. So if we look at the current drug development timeline, it takes an average of about 15 years and about 2.6 billion. And I think that innovations and innovations in technology are what are going to speed up that current process. Now, what I've done with my company is I've taken a faster route. I'm initially developing for the veterinary industry, which means I can cut the development time to between three and five years, and I can cut the cost as well to, point, to about 2.6 million. A vast difference. But if we think about the technologies and how they'll not improve the drug discovery pathway, but also the end user. There are new technologies coming to help you, we'll say your, your watch, for example, can start actually giving you indications of how your health is. So each step along the way not only improves it, accelerates it, but maybe gives you more of a personalised medicine view. I spent three years working in a startup company in Limerick, and it was a group of engineers and biologists working together to develop a high-throughput platform for the biopharmaceutical industry. And that worked really well because you had the designers telling you how you could make stuff, but the end users telling you how you need to use it. And I think that's really important to start these collaborations and communications between the people who are not only designing it, but the people who are using it as well. So that was a fairly brief introduction to what I'm doing, and um, I'd like to thank you for listening to me today. Thank you, Emma, for that warm-up. Um, and now we will get the morning's proceedings started. We have an MC um, of some of you who I, I would have thought many know this former gentleman that I'm going to introduce, Professor Barry O'Sullivan, Director of the Ignite Centre over at UCC and Head of Confirm SFI Centre. You'll see more information at the back. Barry is... Um, out there in the knowledge of what we're going to discuss this morning. He was probably the bravest man in Cork to take me up on the offer to get down here early on a, on a Tuesday morning. And really, it's for you later when we go through the talks this morning to please think of a couple of questions. I'm all about engagement. I think, as I spoke to many of you over the time in registering for it, it is about engagement. So I welcome you to think ahead as you listen to the speakers go through this morning and have some really 
interesting questions for the Q&A panel as we move through the morning's um, guest speakers. Barry, I welcome you to open the morning. Thank you. Thanks, Gronia. Um, it's a real pleasure to, um, to be here this morning. I think this is a, a really great event. So um, as well as being involved in the Insight Centre in uh, UCC and Confirm, which you'll hear about, at the back, which you'll see, about see at the back, um, I'm a board member of IT at Cork, and I think um, uh, if I could speak, if I could be so brave as to speak for IT at Cork for a moment, I think it's a great, um, we feel passionately about um, IT at Cork, about broadening, I suppose, the benefit of what we do at IT at Cork. Um, and I suppose one of the biggest industries in this region, of course, is the farm industry. And so it's a great opportunity to have for you know, the technology industry to come together with, uh, with pharma. Um, and I suppose we would see this as, as the first of many events that, um, that, that we would like to run from, from an IT Cork perspective. And we hope that the farm industry will, um, will invite us to and collaborate on other additional events. I suppose the um, one great opportunity for, for both pharma and information technology to collaborate on together is in this context is smart manufacturing and so most of the talks you hear about this morning will be talking very much about smart manufacturing manufacturing 4.0 and so on and it might surprise people to learn that you know ma manufacturing itself is is probably the second largest employer in the country um, and in terms of what you hear about these days in manufacturing manufacturing 4.0 or smart manufacturing um, Ireland is probably a forerunner in terms of its readiness to adopt manufacturing 4.0 so I think it's very timely for us to be sitting here today thinking about how information technology expertise and farm expertise can come together. And I think there's no better um, uh, area of overlap than in smart manufacturing in the context of pharma. So um, I'd like to, you know, again, welcome you all here today. Um, we have three great speakers um, going to talk about three great topics. Um, what I would encourage you to do is think about some interesting questions to ask these people um, I suppose both about their talks, but also I suppose to reflect on opportunities for IT at Cork and the pharma industry, the IT sector, the Smart Manufacturing Centre to work together, and um, how we can make Cork a centre of excellence um, in smart manufacturing, pharma, IT. So this is um, this is a great opportunity. I think the fact that there's so many of you in the room uh, just is testament to the um, to the interest in the topic. So thank you all for making it here on a very cold day. It's not Thursday, so there's no snow yet, um, so I'm very grateful for that. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce you to our panel, and so I'll introduce you to each of them um, in turn, and then um, we can go to the talks. So we'll have Andrew Hickey from Dupuy, um, who will speak to us first, followed by Joe Devlin from Boston Scientific, um, and John Savage from Action Point will, uh, will finish up, and then we'll have a Q&A, and so we have a couple of people who are going to join us for that. Uh, for that panel. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Andrew uh, to give the first talk. Thanks, Andrew. That's right. That's it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see such a fantastic crowd, and uh, the beast from the east hasn't dampened the spirits yet so far, so it's uh, great to see everyone here today. So, um, so as Barry said, right, my name is Andrew Hickey. Um, I'm the Advanced Engineering Manager within the Puy Synthes. Um, so the Puy Synthes, for some of you guys that don't know, right, is we're based in the Cork, Cork region in Ringeskiddy, but we do have uh, 22 sites across the globe for the Puy Synthes. We're a manufacturer of global orthopedics, and within that there's a number of product divisions ranging from joint reconstruction, so your knees, your hips, your shoulders, into trauma and spine, so fracture plates and screws, etc. So this morning, right, I'm part of the Engineering Science and Technology Group, um, and first off, right, hands up here for myself, right? I'm not an IT, an IT uh, guru or SME, right? So even we were discussing, uh, talking at the IT Cork event. From an engineering perspective, we thought it was really, really important at this stage that we now start to engage with the IT community within Cork because there is a, there's been a huge change in terms of how we're actually engineering some of the technologies we're looking at. And we now really need to have the expertise from an IT perspective because you do have that convergence of the IT and the OT coming together as part of that overall Industry 4.0. So really, right, the future of healthcare, right, if you, took, if you kind of take an overall outside look in, there is 
there has been and there continues to be massive changes and not even massive changes but the speed of change is actually frightening so for example if you think about yourself right in terms of you know what do you expect these days if you look at something if you purchase something say for example on amazon you want to know exactly when you've ordered it where the product is when's it going to be at your front door the very same in healthcare right the expectations for a patient or a customer is changing drastically right so for example I want to know for, I want to keep track of my blood pressure on my phone. I want to use smart devices. If I get an orthopedic hip plant in the future, I want to know exactly, you know, is there potential that I have an infection coming my way? I want to get an alert to my phone, etc. So that's the way things are going externally in the external environment. So with it internally, right, as part of our engineering community, we've recognized that the healthcare is changing so fast. So I think that's really, I suppose, a poke to our engineering community as well, that within the manufacturing space, we now need to improve our agility, our speed of new technology development to ensure that we're ready for that future of healthcare when it comes. So really, it's the, the convergence of IT and OT and the real, I suppose, fourth rev industrial revolution and Industry 4.0. So Industry 4.0, I think even within Johnson & Johnson, which we're a part of, uh, of a segment, it can mean so many different things depending on your, your application or your business scenario. So for example, um, in the medical device industry, what we, what we deem most important of Industry 4.0 may not mean the same for, from a farmer perspective or for the agribusiness, etc. So plus, what we've decided ourselves as a business and engineering community is we need to change how we act, how we work, how we think, how we approach new technology development with our engineering business. So to shift our operating model to ensure that we're really quick and we're starting to get ahead of Industry 4.0 in the areas that make sense to us. So uh, an analogy I use in terms of Industry 4.0, at times it can be like the uh, dung kettle roundabout, okay? If you go into the wrong lane, you can keep going around in circles and it may be a long time until you come back onto the right path. So Industry 4.0, from our perspective in engineering, it's really about ensuring that you're working on the right technologies or applications that fit your business or fit, fit your business need, not just because, you know, it's the sexy thing to do as part of Industry 4.0. So again, look, there's no magic wand to it, um, but what we've done internally as an engineering group is we've kind of changed our methodology or approach. So what we want to do is we want to ensure that we're getting out of our comfort zone in terms of uh, the technologies that we're looking at. But again, we don't want to go into the, the red panic zone. So that can happen, I suppose, in terms of, uh, for example, the engineering director, Andrew Kinney, is here. If I go to Andrew in the morning and say, look, I want 400K for a, a new smart manufacturing wearable, he's going to go into that panic, red panic zone, and he has on numerous occasions, okay? So it's about getting us from that comfort zone uh, into the learning zone, and how can we do that quickly and prove applicability to the business of certain applications. So this is the methodology that we're following now. Um, so as part of new technologies, okay, so if you have a look up the screen here, the first phase is the screening phase. So this is really important as well, not to screen technologies or applications that you just know internally within the four walls. It's about getting out there, understanding what other industries are doing. For example, the agribusiness is making huge advancements in smart manufacturing and um, smart production, the automotive, the aerospace industry. So getting out there, understanding what's happening. For example, my, uh, my father at home is 65 years of age, and a year and a half ago he got a smartphone. I was at home last weekend, he was on his smart device, He's cows calving outside in the farm and he's got the moo call sensor application on the cow telling him within plus or minus of an hour is the cow going to calve so my dad is 65 right he's he's thinking that way so as an engineering perspective we really need to start thinking uh, and looking forward so what we're doing is right we've identified certain applications or industry 4.0 technologies that we feel as a business are important to i suppose driving our competitiveness forward and our on uh, and our value to the business and to the, the prime person who's the customer at the very end. So we are kind of, I suppose, taking some of the, the terminology from an IT perspective, so the scrums and all that sprint methodology. So what we're, what we're doing is we're pulling together the key SMEs within our engineering space. We're selecting the technologies that fit into our business. We're very quickly proving that uh, applicability to the business. So I suppose that we can get to the real important piece, which is the dollar value. So what do these applications mean to the business and how can we literally, either how can we fail fast or scale fast? Um, and that's the methodology that we're applying internally within our engineering group. 
So where to start? Again, it's like a Rubik's Cube, right? But there's just some really important things that we feel um, have really helped us to date. And, and I'm not saying we're, not, we're definitely not um, extremely advanced, right? We're on a journey here as part of Industry 4.0. But a key thing that we, we need to, and I suppose that's, that's the ask here as well as part of the IT industry, the skills and capabilities um, that we need for the engineer of the future is something that we're very conscious of. We have some fantastic engineers that are very technically minded internally, but I think the gap is that bridge between, you know, having all the data, extracting it from the machines, cleansing and extrapolating that into a platform that we can understand and make business decisions. So that's an area we're very conscious of um, and we're starting to, I suppose, change um, the skills, et cetera, within our engineering group. Develop a technology and roadmap, an application roadmap that makes sense to the business not just because it's the nice thing to do. Um, so we spent a lot of time prioritizing some of our applications and technologies, and we have a defined roadmap for, um, for the next two years in terms of what tests and learns we're going after, what technologies are going to be going into deployment, et cetera. Um, and then that key piece is smart objectives and smart use cases. So ensure that you can achieve results, whether it is a fail, but at least you learn from that fail and you move to the next application. So there are three pieces of the industry 4.0 applications that uh, we feel very important to the business. So then just for examples, okay, um, I know I'm caught for time here, the digit is cutting down here. Um, just to give you a flavor for, I suppose, some of the technologies and applications we're embracing within the engineering group within the Puisintes. Um, so if I, for example, there you'll see the virtual reality. Uh, I know John um, and Action Point has the HoloLens on site. So for the virtual reality, the engineering group is using the application um, in the training space, <coughs> um, safety awareness, also smart factory. So. Um, in two weeks' time, I think it's going to be a milestone for the engineering group, whereas the engineering team have developed uh, a new foundry pour line, and that has been 100% done in virtual reality. So the design review is happening in two weeks, and it's going to happen at a global level, virtually and remotely. So there's going to be um, a team in Warsaw in the States, in Cork, um, and then at two vendor sites, and they're all going to complete that design review in a virtual model. So I think that's going to be uh, a key return on investment. Um, in a normal scenario, we'd probably send maybe up to 20 people to you know, that final design review at the vendor site. So this is a key milestone for our, uh, on our journey here in Industry 4.0 in that space. We're also looking at um, production model capacities in plant simulation. So that's an area that we've actively um, pursued. Uh, we have some test and learn sprints done, and we're going into deployment on some areas. The augmented reality. This is an area, I think, which will definitely become um, really valuable and will really scale very quickly. So we're starting to, I suppose, dabble our toes in various test and learn sprints. This is area, I think, is where, in terms of maintenance, for example, um, if you need to change out a spindle of a machine, etc., this augmented reality approach is going to be a very uh, quick and slick way to do that tutorial or assembly process with a maintenance technician. Then again, you see, uh, so you see some of the universal robots down there. So Cobotics and AIV is a big one for our, our manufacturing process within Dupuis Sintas. So obviously the Cobots, there can be, I think the key thing here as well, right, for us, um, what we found is have processes deploy these Cobots in areas that are, if possible, non-GXP, simple tasks, not complicated. Don't tie yourselves up in um, the validation of software validation, et cetera. So start simple. Um, Prove the applicability to the business. If it makes sense, then you can start to look at, I suppose, more complex scenarios. Um, then the smart transport systems. Um, so autonomous intelligent vehicles. Um, so we have one of those. It's uh, the engineering group have it deployed on the site at the moment. Um, I suppose the change management is a huge piece here as well. These are, um, I suppose, applications that can be seen as a threat, but essentially at the end of the day they're not. Um, people can be moved to more, I suppose, higher value-add areas, et cetera. So adaptive process control, um, and then the digital twin, which is a huge area as well, I suppose, is, okay, you have all that data coming from the machine. What do we do with it? How do you cleanse that data? What platform do you, do you use to visualize it, et cetera? So that is a test and learn space with a huge amount of data, but you know, we can extract the data, how do you cleanse it, and how do you make informed business decisions from it? Um, so that's a big area for us this year where we're starting to really dabble into uh, and hopefully make strides that can, I suppose, add proper value to the precinct as manufacturing business. So look, some of the, just to finish off, right, some key enablers. The data infrastructure is huge. Um, for an example, the AIVs that we're working on at the moment have to have a wireless system. We've already found that there's constraints there. 
technology enablers like sensors. I think a key piece, journey can't be done alone, so you have to have key targeted partners that you can work with. The capabilities and skills, which is a huge ask of the, I suppose, people here today that are upskilling people in their business, um, it's prime and external benchmarking. Have, a, have an idea and understand what's happening outside the four walls. So that's kind of, that's my piece. Hope you got some uh, insights into it. I know it's very high level, but maybe in terms of the methodology of how we're approaching it um, can help some of you guys when you go back to your workplace. Okay. Thank you. Great. So that was a very nice um, overview of where smart manufacturing and industry 4.0 and all this sort of stuff um, fit into uh, into the pre. I suppose um, w one of the things to watch out for here is there's so much jargon, but I suppose the uh, we'll try and work through all of that during the Q and A. It's not that scary once you uh, see through it. So. Um, I'd like to invite our second speaker up, uh, Joe Devlin from uh, Boston Scientific, um, who's going to give us a talk on advancing science for life, uh, industry 4.0 and data analytics. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you to Cork, uh, or IT at Cork, for inviting me uh, to speak here today. So I'm a bit like Andrew, not an IT professional. I'm the director of uh, process development for Boston Scientific here in Cork, but I have quite a big passion for data analytics because I see this as being very instrumental in how our business is changing and evolving as we uh, progress into this fourth industrial revolution. So you'll see very much that as we pass through the three previous industrial revolutions, we've meet, meet a, a convergence point where Technology and digitalization is really what's driving this fourth revolution. And it's allowing us the ability to create a virtual world that yet can steer the physical world that we work in. And key to all of this has really been the development of the internet and all of the technologies that have come with that, such as the internet of things, the connectivity aspects of that, the cloud, the ability to share and communicate across multiple sites, platforms, and areas and ultimately the big data analytics that goes with that to allow us to optimize production systems and to drive out inefficiencies within our manufacturing processes. So Industry 4.0, where, where did it begin? So it was a phrase really coined around 2012 in, in Germany, and since then it's spread rapidly across the European uh, countries, where many countries now have initiatives into the introduction of the Industry 4.0 applications. But what is it, really? Is it a, there's no real clear definition or no clear agreed definition of what Industry 4.0. And I think that's, to Andrew's point, is that each company in each uh, area needs to understand what it is that's relevant to their business and their manufacturing that really they want to actually adopt. So for me, it's, a, it's a both a bit of revolution and evolution of the current uh, manufacturing processes. It's allowing us to move from a very much a paper-based transactional processes to more digitized platforms that are driven around data analytics, ultimately designed to improve productivity, eliminate inefficiencies, and to deliver improvements uh, for our customers. So what's at the heart of all of this? For me, it's data. That's what's driving the transformation. So we have the Internet of Things that provides the ability to connect and sensorize everything from our, both our supply chain to our products to actually our processes, and then generate lots of data around that. Where do we store that? We, you can optimize it through our own internal servers or out through the cloud, and that really helps us be able to share and transfer that data across multiple sites and learn from other aspects of our own business. Through that, we use uh, simulation, so both in product development and actual, actual uh, new process development, we look at simulating that virtually before we actually invest heavily from a capital perspective on actual new production processes, so we know that when we're going into production, it's born lean, and that's a term that you'll hear a lot within Boston Scientific about optimized processes going into production from day one. But with all of those things, we have to very, be very much mindful of cybersecurity. So the days of unconnected, protected systems is no longer the case with the advent of the cloud and the Internet of Things. The connectivity and the communication is as big a threat as actually the uh, advances that it helps us in making productivity improvements. So cybersecurity is of paramount importance nowadays, and certainly within a regulated industry such as ours. The key to that is the data analytics. So we generate large amounts of data now every day. In fact, I was there, as I walked from here, my watch was beeping at me. So my watch is telling me I haven't walked enough steps yet, and it told me I should have moved in the last hour. 
that's going to upload to my smartphone later on when I connect to that, and ultimately I'll have data analytics about what I did today. So this shows the level of connectivity and data being generated by every person in this room, and that's only going to expand as we go forward. Uh, additive manufacturing, so there are colleagues here I see from Stryker, so I know there's lots of investment being done in terms of additive manufacturing and ultimately customized manufacturing for uh, healthcare products where now you can print the product that's suitable for the person as opposed to pr producing products over a range of different things. And that's really driving improvements and actual uh, ability to actually serve the market better. Augmented reality, you'll see from Action Point the uh, introduction of the HoloLens. And this is uh, something that's really revolutionizing our ability to train people in a virtual environment and actually give them more real-time information about the processes that they're using in a different manner. And also cobotics. This is particularly important as we move forward into manufacturing uh, 4.0 and the interaction of robots working alongside people in, an, in conjunction with them in a safe environment that allows us to Im improve their ability to do their jobs. So what are these, all of these things doing for us? So they're really helping to drive a business transformation. So they're allowing us to do different things faster and more agile approaches to product development. It's creating uh, customization. It's ultimately getting to that holy grail of a batch size of one. And ultimately, what are these are doing is, is driving new business processes across our business. And the data that's generated from that is helping us to optimize that as we, as we go forward. This allows us to have better vertical integration in our, own pro in our own production processes, but also in horizontal integration across our supply chain networks and our, with our partners in that processes. So really starting to transform the speed at which we do business. But just from a data generation perspective, so this is an example of a facility in uh, Minnesota, which recently, it's been in production for over 15, 16 years now, but recently they did an analysis and realized that they've only just created their first terabyte of data. Quite hard to believe that actually in this day and age, when you consider that an, uh, an average manufacturing line for Intel produces a terabyte of data every 15 hours, and the Large Hadron Collider in CERN produces a terabyte of data every 15 seconds, or 15 minutes. So this is a scale of how data is actually starting to change in different industries, and yet we see this more and more as we introduce new manufacturing processes, new technologies have capabilities that we're not fully exploiting. And that's really where the data analytics aspect of it comes into. We can create the data, but how can we analyze it and what can we do with it? So I'll leave this, I want to start with this picture. So can anybody quickly tell me what that picture is of? What does it mean? What is it? It's an animal. I'll give you a hint. Come on, anybody? Giraffe. It's a giraffe, very good. So very quickly, you made an, uh, uh, an association that that's a giraffe. Not quite your average giraffe. It might be one that needs to go through operation transformation. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's a giraffe. Based on the fact that the pattern recognition you saw on its, on its fur, its very distinctive head, the scale of its neck to its body, albeit maybe not quite in the right proportions, but you very quickly were able to use that data that you've collected over many years from experiences to see that that is an actual giraffe. But how do you teach a machine to know that that's a giraffe? What, how do you tell it that that's what it needs to look for? So we've now started to move into neural networks and the introduction of using uh, neural networks as a means for actually um, doing actual visual inspections. So it's a method of machine learning. It's example-based, so we're teaching machines, but they're self-learning through algorithms uh, on actually what are differences in their products. So if this is a facial recognition um, algorithm, so it's built about two things. One, they're either geometric, so it looks for specific differences uh, that you've told it to look for, or it's photometric, where it starts to do statistical analysis on what it thinks it should be looking for. So you classify it. It's a series of outputs and, and nodes built around um, virtual, or, um, virtual neurons. And it can transfer data back and forth multiple times, so it can iterate its own learning. The ability for this is that it allows us to look at uh, improvements in our inspection. So a human inspection, visual inspection, is about 85% effective and only over a short period of time. So the longer somebody keeps looking at something, the less likely they are to actually spot the defect. We found with this that we've got it to about a 95% inspection rate, and it actually improves from a 95% as you tell it that you've now missed a defect, and that was a defect that it was looking for. And it's increasing. So we're looking to ultimately have machines look at uh, our products to ensure that we're not making defective products and ultimately putting our patients at risk. So this is the Gartner analytic ascendancy model. So ultimately, we're starting on a journey. We're very good at descriptive analytics and diagnostic. We can always tell you what went wrong, why it went wrong. 
what my boss always tells me is, why, did, why didn't you know it was going to happen and what are you going to do to prevent it? And I'm sure people, many people would hear that. So as we move up this chain, the investment and obviously the difficulty becomes greater, but the investment costs ultimately pay back. But that's the business case that you have to sell to, the, to, your, to your management teams to say, this is worth investing. It's worth investing in data analytics to understand and create these processes that ultimately drive better efficiency. So we're very guilty as engineers to always talk about the data and sometimes realize that not everything is a one and a zero, that actually at the heart of all of this is people, because it's people that will make the, the changes here, not the equipment. And ultimately, there's three things that are really going to drive that. One is the technology awareness. So that's within the companies, understanding and clearly knowing what it is within Industry 4.0 you want to implement and why. Having, when I say driven by C-suite, we're not talking about a, a, a type of uh, programming language. We're talking about the corporate uh, management structure. There has to be a willingness and adoption to actually want to uh, embrace this technology and to invest in it. And then it's about having the right digital skills, so creating the culture and having the right people available to help you do this. But there are uh, companies, there are areas out there to help you with this. So digital innovation hubs are around Europe, and they're also within Ireland. There's two specifically. I know Barry spoke about the uh, Confirm Centre, which you can get details at the back. I also sit on the board of I Irish Manufacturing Research, which is the other digital innovation hub. And our job is really there to help try and create uh, centres of learning, collaborations with the likes of Action Point and with uh, ITS and Cobotics and to bring communities of, of learning together across industries, so IT at Cork being engaged with manufacturing in a medical device company or the pharma industry and actually start to show our learnings and actually share those learnings to help drive that forward. So in summary, if I can tell you the three things or three or four things that I wanted to talk about was that Industry 4.0 gives us leverage to respond to market shifts and it'll create new opportunities for us all. People and data are at the core of all of this. And the three main factors that will drive that is having technology awareness, being supported by your management structure, and having the right skill sets to be available to help you do it. And ultimately, there is help out there through the digital innovation hubs. And you need to reach out to them, because they're more than willing to help. So thank you. Great. Um, so uh, thanks for that. I think there are two things that emerged so far in the uh, talks, I suppose. One is skills and people, and the other one is, uh, in some sense, data. And what's interesting from a manufacturing 4.0, industry 4.0 point of view is, um, you know, obviously, as, as well as the, um, as Joe pointed out, as well as IMR and Confirm and these sorts of, these sorts of organizations that are about R&D primarily, um, there are the educational, uh, there's the education sector. So for example, it's important to draw attention to the fact that CIT, for example, have a, a new AI master's that's launching. Um, UCC is launching a new bachelor's program in data science and analytics, and it has already a, a master's program in data science and analytics. And almost every university in the country is, is rolling out programs like this. So it's, it's worth going in and looking at what these programs can do and to what extent you can engage with those uh, programs, either by participating in them yourselves or um, having staff uh, apply for funding under, there are lots of programs by which uh, you can upskill staff now in a funded way. Uh, so there's, there's huge opportunities. And I suppose on the data side, um, you know, th there's questions of data privacy in personal data, and I suppose there's a similar concept in industrial data. So there's a, an initiative around Europe now called the Industrial Data Space, which is looking at data sovereignty in terms of industrial collaboration. So it's, it might be worth, if you're interested in the use of data in, in, in an industrial context, it might be worth looking at the Industrial Data Space Association and what they're, what they're doing and how they're exchanging data, what kind of standards they're introducing. So it's, a, it's going to become as highly regulated and complex as data protection and uh, GDPR is in the context of personal data. So I suppose uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to hand you over to um, our third and final speaker before the Q&A session in the panel. Um, and so John Savage is from Action Point, who uh, brought in the fancy sunnies at the back of the room. Um, and so he'll tell us all about what they're doing there in terms of smart manufacturing and so on. Thanks, Thanks John. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm John Savage, CTO, founder of Action Point. We're an IT services and software development uh, company, and we're here in conjunction with Biomarin today just to shed a little light on augmented reality. 
and uh, what, what could it mean for the life science industry in the relatively near future. So I'm going to start with a quote from a famous science fiction author, Arthur C. Clarke. It's, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We actually have two HoloLenses at the back of the room. One is ours, one is BioMarin's. I'd encourage you, if you can, uh, hang on and get a demo of it, because the way HoloLens and augmented reality brings all the different pieces of technology together, it really does give you this sense of a wow and so on, you know. Oh, sorry, I'll talk closer here, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I guess, like, when we talk about virtual reality, augmented reality, and so on, so I guess it's important just to agree on terminology and just to explore that for a second. So there's really kind of four levels of, of XOR. So virtual reality is when you take the real world and you just completely obliterate it. You put on a headset, you're not aware of the world around you, um, and you have a, a full transposition into a new environment. That's, and that's the most common thing we're probably aware of at this point in time, the, the full head mounted space where you don't see the world around you. Augmented reality is kind of, in, in the strict, strictest sense of the word, augmented reality is simply layering information from a digital source on top of the real world. So if you remember you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 1980s walking around this Terminator looking for Sarah O'Connor, all the information he had flying up in front of him was technically augmented reality. Even the likes of Pokemon Go, just, that's just overlaying a digital image on top of the real world. It's not really interacting with the real world. When you get to mixed reality, that's when you're talking about actually interacting with the real world, and that's the real trick. So with mixed reality, the device that you're actually interacting with builds a model of the physical world around you. And by doing that, it can now get the digital assets to interact with the physical world using, let's say, collision detection, or even simple stuff like when you walk behind a wall, you want an, uh, an object that's in the other room not to appear in front of you. That requires a huge amount of compute and so on from, from the device itself. And then finally, merged reality is it's a little step beyond mixed reality. So the idea of merged reality is that when you're in an augmented and a mixed reality space, the system takes a physical item, so it might be a physical rectangle like this, and it merges a digital asset on top of it. So this podium now becomes a piece of equipment. So it's physically there from a tactile perspective, but from a visual perspective, the visual image of it is replaced with an image that might come from SolidWorks or something like that. So you get kind of the best of all worlds. So that's kind of your progression through the various types of reality. The, the common threads in all of them, head tracking, so you, you, you know, the system knows where you're looking. There's a real sense of depth perception, and it's all done in real time. So it's all really real-time collaborative. So, before I delve a little bit more into the technology, I just want to, I guess, signpost some of the areas in life science, and I'll delve into these more just later on, but the, the five main areas that we're looking at in uh, deploying mixed and, and augmented reality into the life science area is digital work instructions, so getting people the right information at the right point in time as to what they need to do for their task, uh, virtual HMIs, which is augmenting the information available to you as you walk the factory floor, remote assistance is very uh, quickly and easily getting someone to help you in your situation without them having to travel along this or incur huge costs. Training is uh, allowing a user using physical equipment to have information augmented to them to help them in their training experience and to audit their progression through a training plan. And then finally, equipment design reviews is the notion that uh, lots of people collaboratively, and, and I think Andrew, you were talking about this, that uh, from an equipment design review perspective, having lots of people collaborate around digital assets but in a physical, tactile, collaborative way is, is a very, very powerful uh, uh, future use of this technology. So I've got two quick videos. So this one just shows you what HoloLens is doing. So this is particularly from HoloLens. So this is a notion of the object building a 3D model of the room. So this is our lobby and action point up in Limerick. Uh, as you can see, by me just literally looking around, what HoloLens is doing under the hood is it's actually building a 3D model. It's slowly but surely figuring out that, that that there is a cabinet. It's got a horizontal surface, a vertical surface. You can see there's a little gap there between the flower pot that I thought was one thing, and then slowly but surely you realize it's a whole under two different things. So by HoloLens building up that 3D model of the room, that now means that if you drop a ball on a table, it'll actually land on the table, it'll roll off the table, physically hit the floor, roll it on the floor, and run into the flower pot and come to a halt. Um, so from making sure that when you're dealing with a digital asset in a physical world, the system knowing what the physical world actually is uh, allows you to make sure that you don't have things hidden behind walls and that sort of stuff. So it's a very powerful thing to have. Then, from an interaction perspective, these things sit in your head. They're fully self-contained computers, so you don't have keyboards. So how do you interact with it? So the, the seminal the sci-fi minority report with Tom Cruise throwing his assets around as he was exploring the criminal case was like in, it was mind-blowing at the time. And we're actually a bit more advanced than that now because we don't need to wear gloves. It's literally you interact with Holland's by moving your hand around in front of your face, tapping and gesturing. So. The example of this is, you can see here, I'm just going to take this little cityscape model, move it around, adjust it, scale it up, scale it down. 
And it's a very interactive, intuitive way of doing it. It takes maybe literally a minute or so to get used to it. And once you're used to it, it's actually very, very intuitive. Now, you'll see here, as I move it through the wall, it actually collides with the wall and rotates through the wall. So that's a physical model seamlessly helping you to avoid something looking a bit silly. Also, I couldn't move it through the floor. Again, the physical model assistance aware of that physical model. It's a very powerful combination. So going to the use cases. So, uh, you know, I guess in action point, we, we really try and uh, focus on the business value. What's the business case? We, we do not like using technology for technology's sake. I like technology, but only in the context of a business value. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the five use cases we've identified. So digital work instructions, you can see from the previous two videos how it's very easy for the system to pull in digital information and present it. So the idea of digital work instructions is that rather than having a, a tablet or something that costs your operator you know, one hand, let's say, or a paper, which just isn't allowed in a clean room environment generally, uh, you can have a digital interaction with your MES system, getting the re most recent instruction that that operator requires and have it presented to them as they're actually going through the interaction. Also, you can seamlessly audit what's going on because the HoloLens can record the point of view as the operator is doing their task. So it kind of gives you both sides of the, the, the human operator control uh, circle. So virtual HMIs, this is the notion that as you walk the factory floor, we've all seen the traffic lights and the LCD screens. So the idea is that you can actually virtualize those. So they don't actually physically exist. They only exist in the viewpoint of the person wearing uh, equipment like the HoloLens. But HoloLens then is aware of context. It's aware of where you are and who you are. So if you're the finance guy walking the factory floor, you can now actually see metrics in dollars on factory throughput. If you're the ops guy, you start, start seeing maintenance records off the various pieces of equipment as you walk around. Um, if you're the, the, the um, sorry, the maintenance guy, yeah, and if you're the ops guy, it's uh, throughput, cycle time, and so on. Uh, also, if you see a red light on a, on a light stack, you can actually tap it to pull up more information. So an awful lot of IoT is about the data, as Joe was saying, but a lot of the challenges is the data sits off up in the cloud and it's not accessible in a physical location. So having that available via an augmented reality means means that that data captured from the real world is now visibly, visible and interactable back in the context of the real world, which is a very powerful way of looking at the data. Remote activity, so uh, a lot of people here would be very familiar with the difficulty of gowning up and down, going in and out of clean rooms. So if you've got a problem in a clean room and the expert's not in the clean room, it might take a couple of minutes to get that expert into the clean room. Best case scenario, it could be a lot longer, worst case scenario, or they might not, not even be in the country. So this example, of course, is a guy in space, which is a bit extreme, but the notion is that uh, you can get someone to log into your headset and essentially have telepresence to the point of view that they're looking through a camera that's literally mounted here. So you don't have to hold a phone to try and give them a point of view. They have your point of view. Furthermore, what they can do is they can annotate your world so they can drop arrows and circles and annotation in 3D space that stays fixed in 3D space. So as you move around, that arrow that they dropped on the button that you need to press stays put. So it's a very powerful interactive uh, approach to, to helping someone who may not have the skills with someone who does have the skills but is remote. Um, the training side of things, so the idea here is that you essentially, uh, you can create a physical world uh, and you can create tool tips that are available in the physical world. So you can help users who don't know how to use a complex piece of equipment to learn how to use it by annotating that piece of equipment. You can have a training record, you can have an expert whose activities are recorded their hands are now physically moving in 3D space. So an operator puts on a headset looking at the same piece of equipment. They can see the expert ghost using the piece of equipment and learn how to use it. Their ghost can also be recorded then and compared against the expert ghost. So you can calibrate and see how they're progressing towards their training and are there deviations in how they're operating stuff and so on. And you can also audit and make sure that they have indeed checked that this thing is running at 27 degrees or whatever it is that you need to be checking. And the final one, this is highly collaborative. Equipment design reviews, it was raised already this morning. So, you know, there's tens of stakeholders involved, and when these things go wrong, they go very, very wrong. And it's exceptionally difficult to conceptualize 3D objects on a 2D screen. It's even more difficult to conceptualize how those 3D objects are going to interact with each other when they're not side by side on the, tree, on, on the 2D screen. So the idea of equipment design review in an augmented reality and uh, merged reality space is that you can put physical items in a room to represent the physical parts of the line and then overlay onto those, let's say, your SOLIDWORKS objects. So now all of a sudden you can see, is the access panel down here physically going to be blocked by the, by the box next door? As you're walking around the system, rather than it being VR where you don't get any tactile feedback, you'll notice when you walk into and bump into something physical. So using the whole gamut of the full merged reality, you get both a tactile uh, awareness of what can physically move where within the space, and you also get the visual uh, understanding of what is accessible from where. So you get haptics as well as actual uh, visual representation. 
It ain't going to be easy, though. So I'm not here saying, hey, this is all going to be cool, guys. Let's start this next week. So there's major adoption, adoption barriers in the life science space. Uh, essentially, it's a regulated environment, so it's very risk averse and, and understandably so. So what we're working with Biomarin is we've got this three-step process that we're going through. So the first thing is just build confidence around the device itself, operationally, how is it charged, managed, maintained, cleaned, who gets to use it, and so on. Um, then use the out-of-the-box remote assistance to try and build that understanding of exactly what kind of comes out of the box. Next thing would be identify a couple of areas where we can parallel, operate in parallel with a regulated activity, but we are not a regulated activity. So you're just proving that it does indeed add value to a given regulated activity. And once the organization has brought along those various steps, well then you might look at uh, actually deploying a regulated activity on the device, but that's, that's still quite a bit out. So to finish off, like this is, this is an exploratory space. It's inherently an R&D activity. So we have an idea factory, which is a, a process that we bring people through to ideate where AR and mixed reality and so on might be of benefit to the business. It's kind of a case of, look, here's the technology. That's cool. But let's now focus on the business value side of things. So uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I look forward to any questions on the panel. Thanks. And I suppose while we're waiting for Martin, does anybody have any questions to any of the panelists or anybody want to raise an issue? Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, um, <coughs> Cahal Kelly from Biogrim Finance. Um, I'm very interested in, uh, we're working with a partner in Europe at the moment around, we've got a manufacturing and work product process which is one day, and we've got a vision and inspection process which is 30 days, and I suppose I'm finding the question to our show there. Um, you mentioned around visual inspections and using the uh, neural networks and, and intelligence visual inspection. Is that real or is that just, um, is that still high in the sky in terms of, is that something we can actually grab right now? Um, to um, I suppose it, it is real. So we've, we've got to the point where we've proved the proof of concept. What I suppose the hardest process are, are uh, aspect of it is actually rolling it out into a regulated environment. So it's the whole software validation aspects about it, the compliance side of it. So in terms of uh, a proof of concept and does it do what it says on the box? Yes, it does. And we can prove that out. And so we have a business case for, for implementing. Now it's getting through the software validation, the regulatory side of that aspect, and actually then implementing it. So we have it running on a pilot line. Um, it hasn't rolled out right across uh, full manufacturing yet, but it's obviously something that we are going to do because we have visual inspections that are automated currently, but they work off of, um, they're primarily on our labeling and systems, and they're working off a master template. So you're, you're comparing a actual printed version against a master one. This is very different because now you're teaching something to start to recognize the defect, and when it rejects something, you're then updating the database that that is a reject or it isn't, and it's learning from that aspect. So it's a, it's, we see this as the evolution from where we currently are, but it's something we're heavily invested in. Good. So I suppose um, Martin Lee has just joined us. So Martin, do you want to introduce yourself to the, the room? Yeah. Uh, I won't stand. I won't stand up. So, um, no, this isn't working. Here, Charlie. Yeah. Hello. All out waiting. No. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, my name is Martin Leahy. I'm the um, IT director at Biomarin um, down in the harbour here. We're um, a small biopharmaceutical company, two main manufacturing uh, locations, one in California, one here. Uh, I suppose my history is I, w I worked for uh, uh, Pfizer for many years. I was IT director uh, with a, an EMEA role. I spent the last uh, four and a half years outside of pharmaceuticals, deliberately went into a different industry, into the service industry. I was uh, CTO for Abtran. The main reason being to get in touch with newer technologies, cloud, mobility, and starting to move into artificial intelligence and, and, and analytics to try and bring some of that stuff back into, uh, back into pharma when it came back. So as John said, we started to look at uh, augmented reality and mixed reality as a solution for us. We're a small outfit. We wouldn't maybe be as slick as, uh, as, as, as Dupuy and so forth with global programs and that, but uh, you know, that doesn't mean we can't uh, leverage what we're seeing here, seeing here either. Great, thanks, Mark. So we have about 20 minutes, so um, I have a bunch of questions that I can ask them to, I suppose, have these people um, respond to topics, but I suppose I'm conscious that given the time available, that there might be some topics in the room that people want to focus on. So um, are there any things that anybody would like to the panel to address specifically before I start taking up their time? Anything at all? Yeah, go ahead. So where, where are the uh, biggest forces of knowledge are of where you're going uh, with, with, with Industry 4.0. Uh, 
Because you, you mentioned that there's a whole lot of people have different ideas why it is. Where, where are you finding the best source of knowledge and the best source of direction for, for what the right things to do that made the biggest difference? It's not for me because I work with Andrew, so I lived <laughs> um, I guess, I don't know. Um, for me, like, essentially, you know, there's industry best practices from a technology perspective, but for me, it's following the business case. It's, it's understanding what the business drivers are. I think, like, so many industry 4.0 is identifying what areas technology can be deployed into for and the technology driver. But for me, it's identifying, essentially, you know, what is it we're trying to achieve? What is it that's going to drive the business value? What's going to get the C-suite behind it? They're the, they're the key drivers for it. And the technology needs to roll in behind and deliver that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of best practices and every, every vendor you talk to has their own idea of best practices and so on. Um, they all have their own mandate and, and what they're trying to sell you, let's say. But at the end of the day, um, you know, to, to, I think it was Joe's point, people are at the centre of it all. And if you don't have the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, but if you don't have the people at the heart of it all, then, then it's not going to go anywhere. So I think that's probably one of the main drivers that's often overlooked, actually. Um, for me, the, da the data analytics point has been a big uh, change for us. So we've, we produce large amounts of data across the corporation, but it's all separated. So we have SAP, we have MES, and they're, they're primarily there for compliance requirements as opposed to something that's a tool that we could use for data analytics. So one of the areas where we've been, we've been I suppose, trying to convince people is that the value of actually having somebody to start looking at data in a pooled environment has been the real change. So the group in Maple Grove actually hired um, a data scientist from Intel about a year and a half ago on the basis that we didn't have a business case. We wanted to hire somebody who could really spend some time and start to look at data. And his first job was really to take data dumps out of SAP or MES or historians around things that were all separated and put it all together into what he called a data lake. And then he started writing specific algorithm programs through Python just to start to interrogate what was in there. And he was starting to be able to show us huge opportunities that we didn't even know were there. And that really started to, to build a business case for further investment in it. And I think that's the case. Is it, it's a bit of a leap of faith initially, uh, but actually the business case we knew was there was just trying to extract it out of it. And from that, he's really shown the, the actual advances now into actually teaching people how to actually interrogate data and actually look for the trends that are hidden in the chaos of all the noise that we see all the time. And I suppose that's what we're trying to, to get at. But that skill set's very unique. So we had to go out and look for that. Now it's how do you actually grow that internally because typically we hire engineers, we don't hire data scientists. So how do you actually find, how do you create those data scientists internally or how do you go look for them externally? So that's why when I got the opportunity to come and talk here, this is what I'm really want, looking for, is looking, we're looking for that sort of help because that's the bit that'll really change our business. Okay, very good. Yeah, I, I'd say, um, you know, Industry 4.0 is a concept and uh, because it's a concept, everybody in the room here would have a slightly different, different definition of what it is. But if you go back to like the diagram Joe had there, we went through the four stages of, of analytics, you know, Industry 4.0 for us is really what enables that fourth stage. You, know, you start off with individual silos. We all built big systems back in the day. Then we started to connect them. Those are steps one and two. Steps three then is into you know building a predictive plant. You know kind of what's going to happen. And step four then is your adaptive plant where you can influence what happens. And for me, Industry 4.0 is what enables that fourth stage. You know, and vendors and and and, and university groups and, and industry groups that are moving towards that, that's industry 4.0 okay, for, for me anyway. Good, anything else from the audience? Yeah, go ahead, Ed. In terms of your, uh, in terms of this and priorities, in terms of scenario planning with things like Brexit and supply chain, does this get more important or less important? Does Brexit matter? <laughs> I think, I think like, look, it has to come into play, essentially. Uh, like a lot of the day, industry 4.0 investments are going to be three, five, ten year horizons. So yeah, the whole PEST model has to be looked at. What's your political, economic, and social mm -hmm. impact on, on any sort of long-term project? But I think, you know, uh, I can't speak for the multinationals, but from the outside, they're you know, largely US owned. So I don't think Brexit is, is a massive concern in that respect. But um, I'll leave the, the guys in the MSCs. Yeah, well, supply chain. And I suppose I can't, in terms of the external factors, right, um, from an engineering perspective, 
like manufacturing in terms of the orthopedic products. We have to internally be competitive. Um, the external markets for us in terms of what we're looking at, we're prioritizing, I wouldn't say vast amount of test and learns. We're picking for this year for Q1 and Q2, we've picked five specific test and learns. And out of those five, if we get two test and learns that we can um, scale and deploy, and um, that'll be a success for us internally. So currently, um, as part of our engineering space, we haven't seen the impact of any external environment. We're still working towards um, improving our, our speed and agility and competitiveness. There was a question, I think, behind you as well. It, was there a question in the back of the room? No? Yep. Uh, Paul, Paul Galvin from Tendal. I'm just wondering in terms of your, um, uh, you're generating a lot of data, how important is it to get real-time feedback or do you prefer to optimize your process based on a background data and that you, uh, you know, based on the regulatory process, you, you want your, your uh, manufacturing process uh, uh, standard operating procedure fixed? Or can you, with this new data, adopt a real-time kind of feedback that uh, you fix it as you go along? Yeah, I think the uh, real-time data is, is the key holy grail for us. That's what, we, what we're striving to get to. As I said, we're very good at understanding what happened and why it happened. Um, and all of our analysis tends to be you know, the hindsight. We're going back and seeing what, what went wrong. What we really want to understand is what's happening right now and what's possibly trending in the process that could give us a problem in the future and ultimately how do we prevent that. So real-time data is really what, what we're focused on. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we can't wait for re real-time data. Uh, uh, that, that's almost the holy grail here and, and, and the bonus that this is all going to give us. We're a process-driven uh, um, <coughs> company as opposed to discrete manufacturer maybe that, that say it's in, in, in Dupuy, for example. So we, we have a huge amount of real-time data already through our automation systems. What we don't have is on-the-spot real-time trending so that you know an operator or a biotechnician on the floor can, can, can make decisions or make adjustments and, and, and so forth. This goes back again to the predictive plant. You know, Real-time information gives you that. Okay. We have a question from the centre of the room, and then we'll come to Adrian. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So, well, everything you spoke about today is obviously going to be driven by software, okay? And you've talked about the need for new skills in your business as well. Um, where do you see the software capability? Is it going to be a core capability going forward, or is it a supporting capability where you partner with vendors uh, to, to enable your business? Yeah, so I'll take that one. So in, in terms of internally here, right, we're, we're seeing that it's definitely going to be part of the core. Um, so even I think one of the Noreen is down here at the moment, right? So Noreen is actually working at, with J and J at a supply chain level with the academy to actually fill uh, and develop a capability matrix, and that really includes. So we're kind of calling it the, the data scientist or that data engineer who has the mechanical engineer aspects, but definitely um, has that whole software package as well. So internally, we're developing that as a core, um, and on that as well, I suppose what we're doing is we're, we're starting to bring in some PhD students, which have come from, I suppose, an array of different backgrounds, um, but we are, I suppose, starting to develop those skills with those PhD students to embed that as a core um, in some of our projects going forward. Very good. Adrian, you have a question? Yeah, uh, Adrian Aronson from Bill Gates. Um, data is obviously core to what all of you is all about, right? Um, and some of that Absolutely there is. I mean, um, you know, John spoke about the necessary steps where you move steadily through your into a validated environment. And um, it's not just validated from a, let's say, a, a manufacturing point of view. It's also from a GDPR point of view. Um, I mean, if you look at a lot of what's going on here, it's just analysis of existing data, existing systems, and existing uh, boundaries that are already in place. And I think... Um, I think it's achievable to be able to leverage a lot of what the lads have been talking about here and, and, and not, to, not, not, to, not to cross boundaries, you know. But there's no question, I mean, if you look at GDPR right down through the factory, even at an operating level on the factory floor, who logged into the machine, what was their training record and so forth, that's personal data. So absolutely, you need to be aware of it in, in all stages of the design as, as we go through. 
Yeah, I think uh, Martin's right. It's, it's critical. We have all of that within our current manufacturing process where individuals are identified with the product that they're making from a traceability perspective. But it goes beyond that. You, you talk about wearables, but it's really down even into implantables. So we make devices that are cardiac pacemakers or neuromodulation devices. Those devices are designed to not only be unique to the person, but they're also designed to transfer data over the cloud. And that's producing lots of, uh, I suppose, regulatory issues that we're trying to address as we go through that. So when a patient comes home in the evening and they, they go to sleep, the device is downloading data for the day over the cloud to their physician, and the physician is able to then determine whether or not you know, there's anything that needs to be changed in that. So there's huge protection rights over that and how it's actually managed. And so it's, it's key, really, as we go forward, that we are, we're constantly looking at that. Okay. And, uh, and even internally on that, guys, there's, a, there's, I suppose, when you look at it from the internal in the manufacturing space itself, um, like you're talking with the smart wearables, there's a huge, huge um, change management piece um, and behavioral change as well that comes with a lot of these applications. For example, track and trace a product. Um, there's also, you know, applications for track and trace of, say, people movement, etc., within a factory floor. Um, so those things, you know, need to happen to improve the overall operation of, of a factory floor. But again, they are very personal issues, um, and it needs to happen through, a, I suppose, a structured change management approach. Um, and there are areas I think that we're going to have some barriers uh, in the very near future as well. Okay. Was there a question? Was there going to? Yeah. I might bring this back to, um, I was involved in I Wish in both Cork and Dublin, and it's trying to encourage young people to take up these type of courses or these type of careers. Um, and I think it's actually going back really down to the, you know, down to the kids' levels where you need to go to start getting this talent out. Um, I saw a study recently, and it was talking about the number of job openings and the number of gradu graduates coming out. The number of job openings is quite equal um, in the kind of the IT sector, but in the life science sector and in the STEM sector, it isn't equal. Um, these type of events as well, just kind of getting it out there that there's huge amount of potential um, in these industries for not what you kind of normally think. So when I think of maybe Boston Scientific, I think really about an engineer's perspective, but actually you need the, the IT involved in it as well. So I think it's just a bit of awareness about mm. kind of what the potential jobs that are there that might <coughs> be obvious uh, on first inspection. Mm. Very good. Uh, I suppose uh, one thing I want to make sure that we d that we address is, um, th th you know, IT Cork and Skillsnet have uh, put this event together. So I just want to make sure that th the guests uh, of the special guests of the day, which are the pharma industry, are you getting? Is there anything that you that you have that you'd like to ask that you haven't asked? Uh, so f specifically from a pharma point of view, so this is whistling. I think it's been turned off or something. Anybody from the front? Yeah. Sorry, I don't know yet. No, no sure. Go from my perspective, I'm just looking. No, very good question, right? And that's something that we, we struggle with ourselves internally starting off. It's where do we actually prioritize our focus areas? Um, so I'll give you an example, right? So in terms of cobotics and AIVs, just for a prime example of test and learns. So for Dupuis Synthes, right, we have over 3,000 machines across all of our 22 sites. Um, across all those machines, you would expect there's definitely about 40% um, of direct labor fully focused on loading, <coughs> manually loading, unloading of all those machines. So by, I suppose, taking that overall, it gave us a directional value in terms of what we want to go after, um, and it helped us to focus in on specific topics. Um, another area, for example, in terms of the digital twin, which is a huge piece, um, that's, a, that's an area, okay, that we, we can't initially 
um, show a return on investment, but we know it's an area that if we're not involved in, we're going to be left behind. So what we've done is we've picked a specific value stream that has um, the highest runner of, of products throughout that value stream in a knee, knee manufacturing space. Um, we've, uh, we've identified, say, the seven machines that have the highest output of the highest runners. We've connected sensor applications to those machines. We're extracting the data from those machines and those priority products. They're critical assets. Um, and I suppose that's allowing us to understand um, the operational aspect of that high critical value value stream very quickly. And also it's going to help us, I suppose, to justify a return on investment to further expand and scale um, that digital twin platform across other value streams. Mm -hmm. Is that, so I think uh, there are no other questions in the room by the looks of things, so maybe one last one, and then we'll wrap up. Um, I suppose <laughs> there is support there. I mean, there are two digital innovation hubs. There's the um, there's the Connect and there's the actual IMR. So what those are funded through Science Foundation Ireland and Enterprise Ireland to look at you know creating you know the uh, centres of learning and actually interaction with small, uh, SMEs. So with the likes of ITS. So as part of um, uh, IMR last year, we went and visited Universal Robotics, and it was actually through that interaction that we actually realised okay we have a company here in Ireland who's the agent for that that can actually help us. And so Boston Scientific partnered with um, IMR and uh, ITS to look at doing a proof of concept of introducing a cobotic uh, robot into a packaging process. So once we got through the stage of, you know, it was, it was a feasible, we then went away and put together a business case that ultimately created a, a, an investment for both uh, ITS into, into Cork and also for us in terms of actually coming up with a new solution for, for a packaging process. So I think it's, it's looking out there. You have to actually reach out. It's, uh, it's not as straightforward as saying that's on your doorstep. I think it's, it's about being involved in, in community of practices and getting involved in other areas. So there are events that are, on, uh, that are being held around the country. Um, it's important to actually try and find out about those and attend them and, uh, and then reach out to people within the industry to look at, well, wh what's your experience of doing that? Because there's plenty of opportunities for funding through H2020, different initiatives out there. And it is all about trying to advance manufacturing Ireland. And that's really what it is. We're not just, it's not, we have our own selfish, I suppose, perspective from a company perspective, what we're trying to do to improve our own production process. But as a, an ecosystem, we've got a duty of, of responsibility to try and improve Ireland Inc. And we can only do that through the development of SMEs who support us. And I think that's really critical. Okay, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, the other thing is, there's an awful lot of support in this room. You know, I mean, these are our peers. They, 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 every one of us is facing these same challenges. And, uh, you know, we, we can work together an awful lot. Uh, these two guys on my left are going to get a lot of uh, hassle from me over the next few weeks in terms of uh, you know asking them questions and so forth. I mean, look at IT at Cork. You know, Skillnet has sponsored this event. Action Point have sponsored the video for this event. You know, we, we are quite strong ourselves. You don't have to spend millions to have a good idea and, and, and to get it up and running and establish your your, your, your business case. You know. So on that positive note, um, I'll draw things to a close because we said we'd have you up by nine o'clock, and I can see the sun uh, winking in through those curtains. Um, so um, I suppose w one thing I'd like to re-emphasize re is that this is the first of what we hope to be many events, joint events between the farm industry and IT at Cork. Um, and so IT at Cork is delighted to have, um, have uh, organized this uh, event for you. But I think um, if you have any feedback in terms of how you think the farm industry can be supported by IT at Cork, we'd very much like to hear that. Um, and I suppose uh, you can speak to people like Martin here, for example, about that and Sarah in the back of the room over there. Um, I'd like to thank, as Martin has already uh, 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 gotten there, but I, I suppose I'd like to thank uh, Skillsnet and um, Action Point for the sponsorship of Skillnet for the event and Action Point for taking care of the, the video recording. Um, I'd like to thank the people who've been presenting at the back of the room, ITS and Action Point and so on. 
um, giving us some sense of the kind of technology that's available. Um, I suppose a special word of thanks to Grania Bagnell, who's, um, who's put this event together um, with the tech com uh, committee, and of course Sarah in the back of the room, who's hiding by the door, um, uh, for all the support that she gives to all of these activities. If you'd like to join IT at Cork, you'd like to learn a bit more about what, what IT at Cork is doing, obviously you can visit the website or you can talk to Sarah. Sarah can also um, sign you up if you wish, wish to become a member. Um, so later this May, um, as Grainne said at the beginning, the IT at Cork Tech Summit is going to take place, I think that's on the 3rd of May in City Hall. So again, if you visit the IT at Cork website, you can get some idea of what's going on there. But I suppose the event, the purpose of the event is not to sell IT at Cork to you. Uh, the purpose of the event is to bring the communities together. So um, we very much hope that you've enjoyed the event. Uh, hang on those, uh, hang on and have another scone and have a chat and network if you have the time. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to thank everybody involved and, um, and uh, wish you a very good day. Thanks. Thank you.